A big shout out goes to Maxis Tires, Jensen USA, and Fox Shocks for supporting the inside line. Welcome, mountain bikers. Now I'm, now I'm kind of I'm kind of nervous, like because I'm here. Yeah, should be. Yeah, like this is gonna be for real. Hart's got a bunch of questions. Well, uh, Wait, you ask people to send in questions? You bet. No, oh, geez. Mm-mm. Can you see? You can see everything on there too. Yeah, I'm switching my camera, your camera, Have my you, camera, your camera. Did my mouth breathing into this thing? Can you like hear me breathing? Is that why it's? Or you have to talk so close to it so you don't breathe into it. Don't <laughs> kind know. of a heavy. My wife tells me I breathe loud. I believe it. <laughs> Our first date. <laughs> really? Yeah. All right. I haven't even heard this one. Have you ever been part of Strava? Yeah, I've done and Strava. How good would you be on Strava if you were? Well, he he knows the answer to that question. It was me and him doing it. <laughs> What's the, hold on? Let him finish the second half. Have What's you ever name? been part of Strava? And how good would you be on Strava if you were? Oh, the best. The best? Are you serious? At Strava? Yeah. Why do you think you'd be the best? Well, how serious am I taking it? Like, am I like, like I'm on Strava and I'm like Brian Lopes level, like I'm going to try to beat everyone at it or, (laughs) or am I Kyle, you know? Yeah. How good were you at? What are you? What's your name on Strava? I'm either Guy Cooper or Chicken Metasevich. I can't remember which one, but me, that's who me and Kyle were. (laughs) You both shared the same Strava account? No, we had two accounts and we would go out on trails and we would try to find whatever one we thought we could beat Lopes at. Uh-huh. And we would just tow each other down it as fast as we could and try to beat Lopes this time with two people so that he would go to third place. <laughs> did you ever beat him? Do you know if you did? Oh, yeah. He'll say no, but we did for sure. Okay. Cool. He knows who we are. We're going to count it. There's so many questions from people. Kyle just sent these. I asked him to send them. He's like, am I too late? I'm like, no, send him. Like, it literally came in like 30 seconds ago. You sent it to him two weeks ago? No, today, because we figured out we were just going to do it. So, All right, here's another one. Hi, Sage. Okay, I have one question for you, and it is, why didn't you ever pursue a cross-country career in mountain biking? Uh, Because I turned 16. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know, and you... You, like, realize that there's, like, way more fun stuff to do than pedal too hard, like, you know? Yeah. I don't know if I would have ever, like, pursued a cross-country career. I don't know if I liked it really that much or I just like to win, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Did you race cross-country when you were younger? Yeah. I I used How's to... It, like, what level? State champ, bro. Shut up. Yeah. What? How uh, old were you? 16. Huh. That was my last... Then I just raced downhill after that, purely. But for... For years, I would go to like Norbuzz or everything, and I would race downhill, XC, and slalom. Mm-hmm. And then, like my biggest goal in life was the podium at all of them at one. And I did it one year at Park City. I podiumed in downhill, slalom, and cross country. No way. Yeah, I was like a huge John Tomac fan, dude. Had the eagle helmet, led the American flag, everything. Dude, that's freaking sick. It was cool. And I was you, pretty proud of myself. And you went out on top. Yeah, I mean, you turn 16, you get a car. I started going to sheep a lot, and, like, pedaling kind of went to the wayside. <laughs> Not a sheep. You have to sprint, right? It's a different kind of pedaling. Okay. <laughs> that year that I really started going to sheep a lot was the best I ever felt at Sea Otter. You know, like a, a winter spent at Sheep Hill sprinting into jumps, and you go to that Sea Otter, and that flat section never felt so easy. <laughs> See, that's so good. We're going to we're going to keep on with with the submitted questions because I have some from Hart but he also had a specific sheep question. I used to ride race cross country with Rachel back in the day. That's how I knew Rachel. I know is that is that why she's asking? Yeah, when we were like 10 or 11. Crazy. Like well, she was probably 11 or 10. I was probably like 13. Uh-huh. Yeah. How old were you in 04 when I think I met you for the first time? Like you and Mad Dog and we were on trails by Big Bear? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I think it was 04 and I've got like you doing like a, well, no, Mad Dog's doing a gnarly little turn bar. Oh, yeah, Mad Dog was did that like T-Bog or something, uh-huh. right? You're yeah. All, you're all twisted up. You were 18 then? Yeah, I'd have been 18, Damn. 17 or 18. You were state champ cross country. Right before Two that. Two years before that, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Okay cool 
there's a lot of history with old T-Sage. Like, who, who knew? <laughs> I had no idea. Cross country. I just thought you were some... I had a, I had a very a celebrated cross country career. My, the best was I would get smoked in down. I wasn't that good at downhill, but I was good enough that I was like the best downhiller in cross country, right? Uh huh. So I'd be able to like hang with all the dudes on the climb. And then I would every time strategically pass them all right at the top of the climb so that I could just disappear, you know? And then mm-hmm. back then cross country races were real like one up, one down, right? Like a big bear race was race to the top, big bear race down. So like if I could make it to the downhill in touch, like good luck, dude. Uh-huh. You know, like I had it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's forget the sheep question for now. We'll get back to that. Since we're talking about you racing XC at age 16, start from the beginning. There's never any spandex, if that was one of your questions. I was always baggy. And always flats, too? No, I would clip in back then, yeah. Okay. What was the first bike? How'd you get into riding bikes? First bike ever? Yeah, first bike ever. Oh, like a little tiny one. And I had training wheels, but my dad and his buddies, I got all like brewed up one night and broke the training wheels off and that was it (laughs) yeah and they pushed me down the driveway and i was like boom on it and then when i turned four was when my dad let me go race bmx was on my fourth birthday because we used to go out to the desert all the time and drive by orange y bmx which was like the track back in the day like moeller s&m like all those dudes raced out there back in the day okay so we would drive by that all the time and I'd be like, I want to go do that. I want to go do that. And my dad was like, on your, it sounds crazy now, but it's like on your fourth birthday, you can go to the track. Four? Yeah. Yeah. So then I raced BMX from four till 12, but I did my first mountain bike race when I was 10 Okay. and then phased BMX out slowly till I was 12 and then was purely mountain biking after that. Okay. What was, what was the hook about mountain biking? Why was that so much better for you? It's just like, you can go race BMX and you're going to go to Folsom and Fresno and Santa Clarita, you know? And then we would go to mountain bike races and it was like Park City, Big Bear. And I was just like, and my dad was definitely pushing. He's like, this is way sweeter than going sitting in a rodeo arena with like 10,000 kids, you know? Like, <laughs> so we started, yeah, I just loved it. Like right away. Like I was like, this is cool. My first, the first race we did was Big Bear 98, the snow year. Oh, like the one in Headliners where they carved out the snow like yeah. at the top? Yeah. And that was the very first race I ever did mountain biking. And I was like, this is so cool. Like, And me and Kyle actually head to head in slalom. <laughs> yeah, he beat me. He, I never beat him once. At all? Never. Uh, it still kind of irks me a little. <laughs> Your dad's into mountain biking? Like, is he the one that helped you get into it? Or were you the one saying, like, hey, I like mountain bikes better. Let's go to Big Bear or go to Park City? Well, that was the period of time where a lot of the BMX dudes, Mike King and Lopes and all those guys were moving over into mountain biking. So my dad was like, all right, these guys are all doing mountain biking. Let's check it out. And then he had this buddy, Greg Fontaine, who was a motocross dude. And he was mountain biking at the time. And my dad went riding with him because my dad was, they were moto buddies. Okay. He went riding with him. And then he was like, dude, you should try it. We should try mountain biking. Like we should see how it is. And then went and did it a few times. And I was like, this is pretty cool. I, I'm into it. And then, yeah, I just snowballed, you know? Hmm, cool. When did like downhill take serious focus? Like you said, you, you won all the events at one of the races, right? I didn't win them all. I made the podium. Okay. Podium doll. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. When did you decide that just downhill and dirt jump and all that stuff is a lot more fun? And I know you said you bagged XC at 16, but was it a conscious decision to focus only on big bikes and like gravity? Yeah. I mean, I, I gotta think about that. I kind of, I kind of just went that way. Uh You know, I, I was jump, I, I was always known as not being able to jump. Really? Yeah, like I I couldn't jump because I grew up racing BMX, and if you're in the air, you're slow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. So uh-huh. I grew up manualing and ro- hitting rollers fast and like not catching air. Right. Okay. So that's why Kyle would beat me every time. Like every year at Deer Valley, there was this triple, and he would jump in. I wouldn't jump it, and he would beat me. I'd be in front of him. He jumped this triple and beat me, and it was like happening all the time. Right. Mm-hmm. And then finally, I started going to sheep, and then. I'm trying to think how I stopped racing XC. I think I was just like over it, you yeah. know, yeah. like I was like, I did it. I'm not 
Like if you're going to be a pro XC racer, you have to devote your entire life to it and just straight training. But at that time you could be a downhiller and kind of be a dirt bag, you know, like, <laughs> so I was kind of into that whole, I didn't want to train basically is what it comes down to is I didn't want to train. Okay. It, yeah. Did you meet? Like, how did you meet Kyle? Did you know him before mountain biking or was it through mountain biking? No, yeah, just that very first race in Big Bear. We met, we were arch rivals, right? Because that was our first race together. We still are arch rivals. We've never been friends, just for the record. <laughs> Here we, were you arch rivals because you went up against each other in the finals? Yeah, okay. and we would race. We would go up against each other at, like, every race. Mm -hmm. Like, this wasn't just one race. This was, like... Every race, Kyle and I would go up against each other, and he would beat me by, like, a tiny bit. So I hated him. Like, passionately hated him, right? Like, so much. He probably didn't even know I existed, you know, but I hated him. Like, <laughs> and I, yeah, and I, I, like, remember, there's a picture of us, and Kyle's, like, he's, like, got his hands up. You know, he won, and I look so pissed, like, because I used to have glasses, the bowl cut, and everything, you know, and I'm just sitting there just like, F this guy, dude. <laughs> was he all factoried out back then or was he still just kind of oh they were pushing for it like okay. they, they wanted to look factory he wasn't yet he didn't go factory until <laughs> sea otter you know okay when he did when he didn't land his tricks did, and won the contest did the heel clicker yeah <laughs> <laughs> he didn't land what do you mean he didn't know but can't land his side saddle dude and then beat jesme or something right <laughs> dude, jesme. oh man he got little kid points he knows it yeah, but it worked out, don't you think? It worked out for all of us pretty well. <laughs> 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 You're giving him a hard time, but deep down you care about him? Oh, yeah, he's my brother. Like, he he lived on the couch at my parents' house for a long time. Like, he'd wake up to my dad cracking his Dr. Pepper and his paper in the morning, you know? Like, yeah, we've, we've been together for years. Okay. What was it like to... Uh hear about him at rampage this past year because you weren't out there right yeah that that's pretty gnarly because i never expected it to be him you know like i never when every time i've ever been to rampage all that i i were like obviously worry a lot like the whole entire time those are all my best buddies mm -hmm. so like it's a super stressful time but i never worry about kyle because he's so calculated he's so smooth he never steps really out of his comfort zone he he knows what he can do mm -hmm. And then just to hear that and someone's like, or I got a text and it was like, what, what's up with Kyle? And I was like, oh no, you oh, know, man, like, like you got it from someone else asking what happened. Yeah. Someone's like, what's up with Kyle? Is he okay? And I was like, I don't know. Like, so I text Rachel and I was like, what's up with Kyle? And she's like, oh, he's exploded, you know? So yeah. it's pretty trippy. Yeah. It's good. See him come back. All right. But, oh yeah, he's acting like, like, he, we went to a wedding like two a week after or something. He's just acting like it didn't happen. He was just like, looked like the scarecrow or, or the tin man. dude. He could, yeah. He needed oil. Like he couldn't move. Like he, I was trying to make him laugh so that he'd be in pain, you know, like, and he'd just be like, stop making me laugh. Like, but yeah, no, it's really gnarly to see like just rampage in general. You see a lot of your friends get seriously injured, you know? Yeah. It's, I don't know how, I mean, you'd be out there digging with everyone, right? And yeah. Just experiencing it all. Like it just seems too insane anymore. Just the whole thing is kind of dumb in my personal opinion, not dumb, but like unsafe. Like even the diggers are out there. Everyone's standing under big cliffs, like rocks are flying off the cliffs. Like, <laughs> you know, like dudes are hanging out. Like I, one time a guy sent me a photo and I'd been standing on like a 300 foot cliff all day pickaxing and I didn't even know. How do you not know? Like, did you not turn just around? Just the way that the, I don't know, just the way the cliff looked like, it didn't look like what I, when I saw the picture, I was like, whoa, that's where I was standing all day, like pickaxing and like drinking beer, you know, like in the hot sun, in the hot cool. sun all day on that cliff. Like this is pretty unchill. Like, mm. I don't know. I have a very hate relationship for that event. You know, it's not even, there's not <laughs> there even love anymore all. anymore. <laughs> there was back in the day, but not really anymore. Yeah. All right, let's let's go back a little bit. You're racing downhill. You're starting to go to sheep. Like, how does trails life kind of come into play? Like, you start digging out there. Like, where do you yeah. where do you learn the ropes and everything? Because you know, for a while, 
trails and digging jumps was was life for a while, right? Oh yeah, for a long time that's what I did. Like I would that that so I was in high school then still, so I would get off school, go home, watch Blue Torch. You know, like on Fuel TV. Remember that? I think so, yeah. It was like on like three to four or something, and I would go watch that, and then I would go to the trail, get pumped up and go to the trails. <laughs> and then that was the years we had when Carter was around, and Carter was always like real gung-ho on digging, and he was a really good digger and knew what he was doing and stuff, so yeah, I would sure. watch Carter dig and like dig with Carter, and then over the years, Carter kind of – phased out a bit like not phased out but like the hidden valley years he wasn't around as much but those sheep years he would take me like he would take me everywhere we would go to bellflower like every day like driving like an hour to go to trails he'd take me to riverside he'd take me to nasty's house he'd take me like like carter took me to an insane amount of places and drove me around all over like crazy yeah, yeah that's cool it was super cool yeah and like he just took you under his wing and yeah, there like he, I, he, he, I think he wanted somebody to ride with and somebody who was down, and I was always down. And like, yeah, we jump, I throw my bike on top of all his concrete hoses. You know, he'd get off at two, he was a concrete, like he'd pump concrete. Okay. Yeah. So he'd get off work, I'd get off school, and I'd drive to his house, and then from there we'd go wherever. What are some of the sickest trails that you went to? Like, and dude, let's, and go into how Hidden kind of came about. Yeah. Those are totally different. Like, well, hit, <laughs> 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 I mean, I, obviously I would think hidden was the sickest trails, but they were my trails, you know, uh -huh, like yeah. I like literally would build them to like what I wanted to do, you know, like, and I would be down there by myself a lot digging and Hucker, I, you'd show up and Hucker would have built an entire landing. Like that's how Hucker was. He was, we would dig together a lot, but when he was digging with people, He's so ADD, he wouldn't be able to like really do a whole, you know, you wouldn't get much done. He'd be like entertaining everyone, <laughs> uh -huh. but then you would not, it would rain or something and you wouldn't go down on the trails for three days and you'd come back and there'd be an entire landing. Crazy. Yeah. And Hucker would, and you'd be like, where'd that landing cover? I was like, I built it myself, you know? <laughs> You're like, what? Dude, how much energy did that? Like, how did you build an entire landing by yourself? Uh -huh. And then. But like, where did, where'd you learn how to dig all that stuff? Where'd you learn? technique and carter style okay yeah yeah like the whole smear packing thing was carter mm. like i never seen i hadn't seen anyone do that before mm -hmm. like really smooth like before i feel like honestly before all that everything was really round and like moundy looking you know the jumps and there yeah. was like a one smooth line up the lip and that was it right yeah, yeah. and then like i I, I, it's, it's hard for me to give him like total credit for it. Cause I don't want to like bum somebody else out, but I really feel like Carter had a huge impact on just squaring jumps up and like hmm. making wide faces and making things super smooth and like totally rideable. That whole sheep Hills crowd back then, like Robin Miranda and like BF was down, like Brian Foster was down there a bit, but he moved to New York. Like as I was getting a little bit older, but all those dudes were all down there digging and I would just watch them, you know, like okay. try to learn from them. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool dudes to learn from, right? Like, uh, yeah, you think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but their technique wasn't to like turn the jumps into sculptures, basically. No, and I think that like the really them becoming sculptures and like really squared up stuff that came from Riverside because they had the dirt for it mm -hmm. like that that orange Riverside dirt you could, it's real easy to like smooth out and square up whereas where we were digging we were fighting water and we were fighting like at sheep Carter one day came down he's like we're gonna run pipe to the lake so we can pump water <laughs> no way. and I was like dude the lake is way over there like how far is that and it was like five or six hundred feet of a PVC that he ran. There's still a spigot in the bushes out there. Crazy. Yeah. And we, and we would put the pump at the lake and pump the water into a hose. And then we would water the jumps at the, at sheep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One day I was down there watering the jumps and the ranger came down and he was just like, where's the hose, bro? Like, <laughs> you're like how are you getting water right now? <laughs> What'd you tell him? I was like, uh, oh, there's a pump in the woods. Like, he wasn't that psyched on it, but he, I was like 17. So he's like, good on you. Kind of, you know, yeah. like get out of here, but like sick move. <laughs> Dude, that's so bad. Where does it go from there? 
Like, cause well, there was like, there was a sheep, there was like the sheep period where we were all riding sheep and, and that was fun. Right. But you get a little bit older and you start like having fun, like with your life and stuff and you don't want to pedal, you want to roll in. Right. Like you we go to like Riverside <laughs> and they got roll-ins and like, uh-huh. you know, like yeah, yeah. everywhere they all have roll-ins and like downhills and we're like, dude, we need a downhill. And then Hucker and this other kid started building because Hidden Valley was there before. Okay. There was like a first generation of Hidden with like all the sick dudes like Stricker and Bar Spinner and the Foster Brother, all that, like that whole crew, like SHL crew, like Todd Lyons and all those dudes. So they had Hidden before and it got plowed. But when they plowed it, they couldn't get the tractor to tear down the Stricker line, hmm. which turned into the four pack that was like the first line that we ever had. Okay. Like the main Hidden Valley line that everybody always saw. And yeah, when the, when the Stricker line got rebuilt, that's when I, cause I was like at Hidden and, or at Sheep digging all the time and Hucker would be like, dude, there's a new spot. Like, come check it out. Come check it out. And I was like, I don't know, dude. Like we put a lot of work into Sheep, you know? Like, <laughs> and then we went down there and we we're just like, whoa, there's a rolling and the jumps are steep. Like this is the spot now, you know? Mm. So we all started digging there. Okay. Was it a lot further from where you lived? It's a bit further, but when you're a kid, five miles is, you know, especially a kid from Orange County where like five miles is, could be 45 minutes, you know? Like, <laughs> totally. How'd you deal with people showing up and riding and that very rudely. you're not digging? What? Very what? Very rudely. <laughs> <laughs> Did it happen a lot though? Yeah, a e- lot. Even with like how legit the jumps were? People just showing up and poaching and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we'd get a lot. Like we had one time I we showed up and the whole mega tour was there. Like, you know those remember those props movies? Yeah, yeah. And the mega tour was there and I was like, You guys gotta bail, you know, like trail boss them and they were like <laughs> yeah. and they beaked at me and I tore the first jump down. Shut up. <laughs> yeah. Just out of spite. Like, I just, just pickaxed the first lip down. Oh man, what'd they do? They were like, uh, just harshed us, and then we just rebuilt the lip when they left. <laughs> but they kind of know the score, right? Oh, they're like, oh, mean mountain bikers, you know? And it's all these dudes, what's funny, that are mountain bikers now. Like, some of the dudes that were there that day, yeah, being pricks, like, are now getting checks to ride mountain bikes. Yeah, so. yeah, for sure. Yeah, talk, talk about that. Like, the kind of the BMX versus mountain bike, and how you and maybe carter kind of helped bridge that gap a little bit it it was a gap like there was a definite like we were not wanted Mm -hmm. you know and like yeah carter carter was huge with that bridging that gap because he was the one making the phone calls and getting us to the spots you know without him we would have never even got into the spots Mm -hmm. And, and then kyle too so like kyle did that hb contest and those dudes were ruthless on him like really Oh man, gnarly. Like John Paul Rogers and those like Hesh, super Hesh BMX dudes were just super unchill about everything. Mm -hmm. And then there was like, like dudes like Nasty was always cool. He didn't care. Like he's just like, whatever, dude, I'm gonna do my thing. But like Parslow would just harsh us, like be super, super rude and not let us like ride and call his name. Did you ever see that you could ride? Oh yeah, we'd be riding like Gavilon or something like. That was Nasty's like spot, which mm-hmm. were like the sickest, biggest jumps ever. And we'd be riding the jumps with him, tricking all the sets, doing whatever. And he, but he'd still like had a problem with it. And it's like, why? Hmm. Yeah. Like, what's the problem? You know? And we would get, yeah, we would just get hassled everywhere we went. So even at Sheep, like everywhere, you would get hassled for having a mountain bike. Hmm. And like, I mean, when you look back on it, they were pretty goofy, like our bikes. Like, cause before, Carter and before black market, we were riding cross country bikes, yeah, you know, we were riding sure. XC bikes that had drop seed po- like, you know, we had, were building them out to be dirt jumps bikes, but in no way, shape or form were they made to be jumped. They're basically like, yeah, size, small XC bikes. Like, exactly. So the top tube sloped down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You're like, all right, this one's got a 16 inch seat too. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I bought that. The bike before I had uh black market was a Santa Cruz chameleon. And that was like the closest thing that I ever had to like an actual dirt jump bike. And I think the C2 was 15 and a half inches or something. Mm -hmm. And then Carter's like, we need to go 
13 inches or something. I was like, you're insane, dude. <laughs> and he's like, the top tube's got to be 21.5. And I'm just like, this, that's insane, bro. Like, that's the smallest bike I've ever heard of. You know? Yeah. But yeah, it does seem like that mountain bike, dirt jump specific frame, like a black market. And whoever else was around at the time, like, sort of helped bridge that gap and, like, kind of pull the style in a little bit tighter. Yeah, definitely. Like, but it still took a really long time yeah. before there was any sort of like cohesiveness in it. And I really truly didn't see it until now. And the bikes are, the mountain bikes are sick now. Like a trail bike is you, anyone could jump on one and go rip. Mm-hmm. And that's when the mount, the BMXers start and they're all getting kind of older. So they started like actually <laughs> mountain biking and they're like, Whoa, this is pretty cool. Like actually it's like, yeah, we've been telling you this for 20 years. <laughs> like it's pretty sweet up there in the yeah. hills, you know, like, yeah, they were, I don't know. I, I try to think of some times where we, we used to get harsh, like pretty bad. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's cool to see that it's not that, that way now. Oh, uh, no. But do you think, what do you think about bike parks being everywhere? Maybe kids don't have to work to build trails to have something to ride. Like, is there kind of two sides to it? It's like, yeah, you got harshed on by, you know, BMX dudes, but you had this work ethic to build stuff you had to ride. But I also think like you're saying, yeah, I, I totally agree with you that the kids don't have like very much work ethic and they get free stuff to ride and that's kind of lame, <laughs> okay. but it also gave me this insane chip on my shoulder, like that I had to go to every spot and be the baddest dude. And like, like I would go to Rick's trails in Riverside and I wouldn't warm up. I wouldn't do anything. I'd get out of the truck and I'd hit the big line hmm. like straight in. Just, I'd go, Just hit. to like prove yourself. Yeah, because there'd be like all these BMX dudes sitting there, 20 of them, and you get out with your mountain bike and you're like, and they're just like, oh, beacon, and I would just roll into the big line mm. and hit the biggest jump and like do a nasty whip or something and be like, you guys got more to say, you know? <laughs> like, we're here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Is it, Do you feel like that chip on your shoulder is a good thing? Or are you saying like, eh, I wish I didn't have to do that? Both, you yeah. know? Like, it, it took a while for me to be like, get over it, you know? Yeah. Like to this day, I still kind of like slightly eggy about BMXers, <laughs> you know, like yeah. don't, don't come in our scene after you harshed me for 15 years, you know, like, yeah. and try to, but it is what it is. Right. Like, uh, yeah. It seems, I don't know if fair is the word, but yeah, I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. It was like, it was lame the way they treated us back then. Yeah. Especially Luke Parslow. Can I say his name any more times? <laughs> <laughs> he was the worst oh man it's too bad like, yeah yeah some dudes were super cool about it like uh oh i mean the fact that like, like pinter you're, you're like, hanging out with hucker all the time like he didn't seem to care obviously oh but everyone kind of hated hucker why because he was kind of annoying hmm. like he was the kid that was like you think i can 360 that and we're like yeah we saw you do it 20 minutes ago hucker <laughs> Okay. He just wanted people to watch him, you know, like <laughs> Hucker was a show when he was younger and it took Hucker a long time to get like older and like, you know, chiller. Cause he was like an insane person. I used to make Hucker go home. <laughs> like I used to be like, you have to go home. It's over for you today. Uh-huh. Like we've all watched you hit the ground enough times. Like uh-huh. no one wants to cart you out of here. Yeah, like yeah. you have to go home. <laughs> the Badoo, the best Hucker one ever. He's like starting to rip, right? There was like one day he did a backflip. Like he was just this dirty trails kid, right? He uh-huh. couldn't barely ride. One day everyone's like, dude, Hucker did a backflip yesterday. And everyone's like, what do you mean he did a backflip? Like, the <laughs> kid, you know, like, and then he got good, like fast, really fast. Right. And then McCall was at the jump at sheep. Okay. And he's like, why you guys call that kid Hucker, dude? He rips. And kid you not, five seconds later, he exploded at our feet. <laughs> and I was like, that's why we call him Hucker right there. <laughs> that's awesome. It's cool to see how far he's come along. Like, obviously, I didn't know that history about him, you know, like you do. But he's like a the, the, the dudes were mean to him, like BMX dudes. <clears throat> like Morales and his crew, like those cult, like Dakota and those dudes, they would harsh Hucker. Because Dakota and... Now they're cool and stuff, but like they were mean to Hucker, mm. like really mean, like just, schoolyard mean, you know? Yeah. Like just, he was kind of different and annoying. Like you said, Yeah, he's just kind of, he was kind of annoying. Yeah. Like he was just a hyper, like hyperactive child, you yeah. know, like, and you're like, dude, chill out. Like, <laughs> and he, he would get so dirty. 
Like he would crash 40, 50 times at sheep, you know, mm -hmm. and that dirt sticks on you. Like, and you're dirty if you crash a sheep. And then Robbie Miranda would take him home because he was his neighbor and he would make Hucker strip down into his underwear before he'd let him get in his truck. Because <laughs> <No way. laughs> for people that don't know, sheep's like, basically it's like a lowland, like kind of wetland area. Yeah, it's below sea beach. level. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, some funky. Oh, kinda... it's toxic, dude. Who knows what they did down there in like the 60s or something. But because it's oil fields, all of that. Okay. Like next to it is all this oil reserve, like where they've been pumping oil for the last, you know, hundred years. Hmm. So like if you crash there and get a cut or something, you better go home and clean it. Hmm. Like it's, there's, it's toxic down there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Roll into two, six stallions and that whole development. And you know, when did like your kind of mountain bike race career subside a little bit and, you know, you get into more of the fun having and, you know, ultimately turn into media guy i think that's when me cam and kyle really started to hang out together yeah cam zinc yeah yep. when so then when we when we all one year at like vermont this was after i started going to sheep and we I, in slalom i jumped this like jump right like some big jump uh -huh. before anyone did it and i was walking back up and zinc looked at me and goes when did you learn how to jump <laughs> no, wait, really? I was like last winter dude i've been i've been practicing you know like, and then we like started kind of hanging out and then that night we all just like kind of raised havoc in the hotel like a bunch of us and we all became friends before that we like weren't friends okay you know and then like we all became friends then and then cam would come and stay at my parents house a lot and he'd stay in my room and kyle would have to sleep in the later room <laughs> Give him the food. <laughs> <laughs> and me and Cam, I remember Cam was laying, like, you know how when you're a kid and you're having a slumber party and you're just like, you don't go to sleep, you just talk, you know, while you're laying there. And we were like, we need to make a video, dude. Like, we're sicker than all these dudes. Like, you know, we need a video. Like, And we were watching all kinds of, like, snowboard movies and stuff at the time. And we're like, we need to make the craziest video anyone's ever seen. You yeah. know, like, this is the time. Like, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I think I'm going to buy a camera, dude. Like, let's do it. You know, and then... That's when we, I went and bought a VX, a 2100. Mm -hmm. Like I, well, I was working, I was working in this factory and then I saved up 3000 bucks and I quit and I bought the VX. No way. Yeah. What was the factory? It was like a Bell Helmets distributor, hmm. but there, I don't know. The guy was running some sort it was squirrely, whatever the guy was doing. <laughs> okay. Like he had like bellhelmets.com, but he wasn't Bell Helmets. Whoa, like weird. he was like an OG, like in the dot com world or something, right? And he bought this <laughs> domain name, like, and then he was like selling Bell helmets, like, but he's also selling like other bootleg stuff, like on the side. Like it was a trippy deal. Hmm. Like half the time I would just sit in this room gluing uh, mouthpieces and rubber back onto helmets that he bought, like super discount, and then he would sell them for like thirty five dollars. So I'm like, I don't know what this guy bought these helmets for, <laughs> and then paid me to fix them. But like, these are sketchy helmets, <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> Everything was squirrely. And then Kyle and Cam would be like, come ride, come run. Like, I got to work, you know, like, yeah. got to work, got to work. And then, so I bought the camera and then, yeah, after that we made get some. And okay. then, yeah. Who, who came up with two six stallions? Probably Cam. Okay. Oh, no, because the stallion spark came because Dakota and um, Robbie Morales and them, they had a crew and they were some animal. Like the cobra, not the cobras, because that was Behringer's deal, right? <laughs> okay. They were some kind of animal, and we're like, well, we're the stallions, you know? And we're like, well, we're two six, you know, because we ride twenty six. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's like how it stemmed. Okay. If I'm like not, I don't know. Cam might be able to tell you better, but okay. Yeah, because that's how the the stallions came from. Was that we were like rivaling crews at the trails, <laughs> yeah. you know? And then, yeah, and then. Cam took me on a neural disorder trip for me to try to get in the movie. And I was just filming on the trip with my VX mm -hmm. and I became friends with Axel. And then at Whistler, I went to a dinner with them and I sat by Axel and I just talked to Axel the whole entire time and hmm. kind of like lied a lot about how good I was at filming and like <laughs> that I even knew how to do it. Huh? It's like you lied a lot. Well, not lied, but I like said I was really good at filming, but I wasn't, you know, I had, it was a VX. I didn't even know what a F stop was, you know, like, 
Yeah, but okay, maybe you're not like a tech dork with the camera knowledge. But... He saw potential. Okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I think at that time they kind of needed somebody to just go around with those dudes because they were like these young, squirrely kids, like, and like they needed somebody to film this young, squirrely kids, and that's yeah. where my like position was. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So because your boys with Cam and Straight, a new world needs footage and kind of lifestyle stuff you got hooked up with the yeah crew and film how did it all work like did they give you a film camera like how'd you learn all that stuff oh dude <laughs> this is insane <laughs> the guy tom old spice we called him he was an og like filmer for like a bunch of new world stuff okay he came to my house with an aes like a 16 mil camera and he taught me how to load the film and he was like peace good luck he's like here's your light meter like, like, you know, cause I had, I, well, I had like convinced them that I knew what I was doing <laughs> and I couldn't be like, dude, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to work this thing. You can't Google it. This is like be pre Google. <laughs> right. Like, so I'm just, and then I get shipped off to Panama first trip. Dude. Just like by myself, just with Cam and Kyle with this camera. I don't know how to work. How many rolls of film did you ruin? I actually pulled, so this is the thing is I pulled it off and there's like a shot of Wayne Goss and he like does this thing and he tail whips out of it and it made the movie. And I got like three or four clips from that trip that made the movie. Okay. And I was, dude, I didn't know what I was doing. Like, <laughs> like no idea how I exposed anything. Right. Like, cause there's no viewfinder. Like you're not looking through it being like, Hey, everything looks good. No. It, the viewfinder on an old area S looks like it has Vaseline on it. You barely look through it, you know, <laughs> yeah, like, uh -huh. and I was, yeah, I was out of my own. And the, and there was a bunch of this stuff was at night. So I'm like, yeah. I'm supposed to, my first year, I'm supposed to film with film at night. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm, I remember having a conversation with claw and we were trying to figure out what film to put in the camera. And he's like, I think like the bigger numbers for, you know, like we were like, dude, we literally had no idea. And we were all just trying to figure it out. <laughs> That's so insane. Yeah. Oh man. When when did you actually learn how to use it? So then we I started doing Utah trips okay. with with Axel. And okay, so is that kind of easy to film? Like Utah? Yeah, it's all freaking. And I was on and I was sun, wide angle. Ground is white. Okay. So I was wide angle guy, right? Yep. So my job was to just get out of the shot. Okay. But get a sick shot, but don't be an axle shot, right? <laughs> like so I'd be like hiding in like rocks and like covering myself up and stuff, you know? And he'd be like, push it a stop, Sage. And I'd be like, oh. grab the like F stop ring and be like, Maybe that's push. <laughs> you know, like oh, like oh, I don't and I'd be like, What are you at, Axel? You know, like, I got this. And he'd be like no five six and i'm like oh all right five six okay. you know like i got it and i just kind of bs my way through the first couple shoots and then once you start film we were only shooting in good light so you only needed a few stops right because you're like always shooting in between five six and eleven or something when you're shooting in good light right yeah, so yeah. once we were there i was like all right we're, we're doing this like the first shoot i did though was with mccall and it was pouring rain like out in Santa Cruz in the rainforest. Uh -huh. And I had on like what I'm wearing right now. <laughs> and, the, and it's pitch black in those woods. The, the darkest day of, ever in history of mankind. <laughs> like, like he must've been like pushing the film like crazy, you know, like <laughs> insane. He's up in the axles. He axles up in the woods and he's, and me and McCall are cold and wet and over it. And Axel's like, this is cinematography. <laughs> <laughs> Cause it was sick. Like when you look at those shots yep. in the movie, it's like new world. I'd say six when McCall's like downhilling in the woods and it's like real moody and there it's really sick. Mm -hmm. But at the time it was horrible. It was like the worst day of my life. <laughs> and my whole job was to carry the dolly. And keep the umbrella over Axel all day so that he didn't get wet, like with his cameras and stuff. So I was like holding an umbrella like this, just getting poured on all day long. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but are you getting like day rate for those dudes? Like, yeah. how do it all work out? Yeah. Well, yeah. If, at first, it was like kind of like I remember D was like, I'll give you a hundred bucks a day. And I was like, I'm rich. Yeah. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> and then. And then we started like just I was just going on shoots. It was like very like he would write me a check. I was like, oh sick. You yeah. know, like cool. Thanks for the check. You know, like I didn't need money. I live with my parents. Like 
whatever like <laughs> it was just cool like we were going all over like doing all kinds of cool stuff and then i became like the utah guy <laughs> you know like so i would be with axel in utah for three four weeks sometimes five like five was my max if i was out there for five weeks and i'd have to go home yeah and that was like kind of new world's rule was like if you were on the road for five weeks you got to go home because that's when you start like kind of just you know, going crazy and doing bad work and stuff right yeah yeah talk talk about utah and i assume green river area and stuff like yeah, that general uh, area like talk about being out there for weeks uh, on end i became I, i'm the honorary mayor <laughs> Like I go, I I go in that town right now. High five half the town. Huh. It's crazy. There's like 50 people that live there, and there's one restaurant. So well, there's two restaurants: one for lunch and one for dinner. Okay. So you would like stay in the hotel. You wake. You do a 5 a.m. shoot. You come back to the hotel. Jump on the beds was what we would usually do. Wrestle, <laughs> you know, because we're young kids. And then you eat lunch. You go back out for the evening session. You come back at nine nine o'clock at night eat a cheeseburger and go to bed every night cheeseburger dude same th like that's all they had at this raised tavern like just uh -huh. cheeseburger and fries and we would just cheeseburger and fries cheeseburger and fries for five weeks straight and uh, like now i think about it it's like dude I would, there's no way i would do that like i'd put a salad in there or something right but like <laughs> man the bloating but you're up at 5 a.m like are you out there helping build like let's okay say you're out there for 15 days how many days are you actually getting clips oh there was a lot of times that i would go out there and just to build so like me and axel would drive around we'd drive around and, I, and i'd be like oh look at that and axel would be like all right like what what do you think and i'm like oh, i bet this dude could go off there and land there and like because I, I had a good sense of what each dude could do right because i was always riding with mccall and i was always riding with zinc and always riding with straight and i I just knew like what these dudes capabilities were, what kind of tricks they would be able to do on certain things. Mm -hmm. So I'd be out there kind of finding the jumps and building them a lot of times. And then there was a lot of times where we were with the dudes, right? Like Bordeaux I spent a lot of time out there at Bordeaux, yeah. like an insane amount of time, which is awesome. It's the best time you can have <laughs> because he's out there helping build like scout and going to ride. Yeah. Bordeaux would scout, build, ride everything himself. Like without the Bordozer, his big truck, we yeah. wouldn't never got to like half the zones. Oh, really? Like he would just drive, like he'd be like, we're going there and just drive across the desert. <laughs> and we'd have to like dig, you know, there'd be big trenches out in the desert and we'd cover them up and we just to get out to spots. And like some of the missions would be like half a day just to get to a cliff and be like, well, that cliff's 300 feet tall. And it looked perfect from the road, you know? Then you get there and it's just, there's no point a lot of times yeah were you ever worried about being that far out and like someone being hurt not not until bordeaux got hurt mm -hmm. like i never once thought about it and then bordeaux on a shoot it was like the end of the year september all the footy had to come in because that was when the movies they premiered in september right mm -hmm. like at interbike or something. at interbike so like at the end of at the start of september you had to have all your footy in and bordeaux didn't have a part one year like not a full part so we went out to Utah on this like final mission and we were out this place called exit 97. It's like, it's way out there, mm -hmm. like an hour from anything. Right. And Bordeaux broke his neck yeah. and he was like, I was filming straight on at him and he crashed and he was like sliding down on his face. And we were at the top of this big mountain, probably five or 600 vert, like tall. And it was just me and him. And I ran over and he was blowing the dirt. Like, out of his face so he could breathe and he's like don't touch me my neck's broken and i was just like oh my god whoa you know and i was like what that what do i do and he's like go get the tailgate and i was like okay like go get the tailgate like, like you pulled the tailgate off the truck yeah so we ran so it was me sorgi dusty bordeaux and his brother so we ran me sorgi and dusty went and got the tailgate off the truck and bordeaux's brother climbed like the biggest mountain we could find to try to get cell service because we had no cell service we had no safety. We had no satellite phone. We were just absolutely unprepared for the situation that was happening, you know? So we drug the tailgate up, like strap board up to it like a backboard, like got them all still. And we were, had to like, it was so steep, right? Because this was the line board I was supposed to be riding. We had to drag like the back of the tailgate, like down the hill, right? Mm -hmm. And then we got to the chute at the bottom. <laughs> I'll never forget it. It's like, 
we were like, how are we going to get through this shoot? Like, there's no way we're going to make it through this shoot with Bordo on this tailgate. And Dusty, the other cameraman's like, this is your time, boys. This is when it, this is when you shine, you know, like this is when you become men, like, <laughs> like pumped us all up. And I remember Sorgi was like little then, you know, like he was young. Okay. And he was like, and he's like, Kurt, this is your time. You know, it's like, you got to be strong right now. And like got all gnarly. And then we all like, we all got pumped up and like drug this thing down this cliff. And we, then we could see it. We finally got a hold of like safety and they were going back and forth on the road and they couldn't see us because Bordeaux made a road into where we were at. Okay. So they had no idea where we were. Right. And we're like, we're on the road we made. Like you got, you got to <laughs> go here to get here. Finally, they got there and they were just like, whose idea was the tailgate? Like they were just like, dang, you guys killed it. You know, like <laughs> when they got boarded to the hospital and then, yeah, it was really like really solemn afternoon, I like bet. night, you know, like everyone was just like, what are we doing out there? Yeah. Did you guys just wrap it after that? Oh yeah. That was it. Yeah. Okay. And Kurt crashed too. I think that same day, like pretty hard, like mm -hmm. right before that, I feel like he crashed. Okay. So it was like, just kind of curious. Like it was just, we were rushing it and trying to get stuff before the movie was, you know, it was just not right situation. Yeah. And that was the very first time that I was like, okay, we have to be safe. Like what we're doing is heavy metal prior to that. I had never thought that anything was like really gnarly. Like it was just what we did, you know, like the dudes went out there, we filmed them do the gnarliest things there was. Right. And that was the first time that I got, like I would get scared when I was filming, like, and I would like, like I'd get almost as pumped as those dudes, you know, like, and I don't know how pumped they are. I've never done one of those, but like, you know, like I get pumped, you know, like, yeah, yeah. and like, that was the first time where I was like, I don't know, man, like, this is scary. Like, this is real out here. After that, was there more preparation with? Yeah. After that, we would always have um, this guy Dem out. He was a safety guy and we'd always have a satellite phone. Just, yeah. After okay. that, we were smart about it. Yeah. 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 Nuts. Those those missions sound just so heavy. This having been through there plenty of times, and you know, I've gone through Green River, just the town, like driving back and forth and stuff. It's like there's nothing there, nothing, there's nothing out there, and you guys are chucking off price. In the you desert. have, you have yeah. to get to price to get to a hospital. Yeah, no one ever thought about that. Yeah, you know that's crazy, man. So where does you know working with free ride take you you know like do you, do you move into the digital age a little bit do you see yeah so when or? i was do when i was working for free ride on i would say nine and ten new worlds i was uh shooting digital so seven and eight i shot film and then for nine and ten i was like micing the dudes up that was when like sound was becoming a thing in the movies, you know, like mm -hmm. prior to that, it was just music and dude ripping. Yep. And then the collective came out and Axel was like, we got to beat those guys. You know, like <laughs> it was like every shot's a dolly shot. Like it was like a war, right? Like yeah, we were like, sure. we have to take these guys down. Like we can't let these geeks beat us. Like, so we were like <laughs> out there just like doing dollies and miking the, and I would like mic the ground up and mic the dudes up and like, that became my job. And then from that digital age, that's when I started working for SRAM, I think, right after that. Okay. Yeah. Doing like video projects? Yeah, I did like um, Jordy's comp mm -hmm. for the Black Box thing for Tyler. And that was kind of like my tester. Okay. And then I like worked in, did like a, I think I did like a three month contract. And then I did like a six month. And then I did like a nine month for a couple of years. If I, if I remember right. But we like eased into it, and then I was I did three years like actually working for them. Okay. With Adrian. Yes. Yeah, so talk about you know that relationship like it's Adrian. It was the best. Like I wish it. We, I Adrian wish Marco, we could figure it out right now. Yeah, Adrian, Adrian Marcu. Like, yeah. there's no like dealing back to, dealing with a photographer and a filmer. It can be very difficult, and like. That's why on the New World ones, we always had John Gibson and Gibby would just, he was on his own program. Like yep. he never messed with any, he never got any shots and it was great. But then you get like Sven, right? And you have to deal with Sven. <laughs> and that's like the worst person you could ever deal with. You know, like he's not going to get out of your shots. He's like, he's, he's there to do the same thing you are. And like, no one takes precedent, right? Like, right. 
So then when you get with Adrian and Adrian's like over in the woods shooting some crazy angle that like no one's ever seen before. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I like this guy, dude. He's not trying to shoot fish eye, you know, like (laughs) he's not right in there. Like, so me and Adrian, and we just really got along together really well. And, and Tyler was friends with him prior to that. And then we just, we realized what we could do as a, like kind of a media group, right? Like, so we went at, we did GT for a little bit while we were doing SRAM and we were just trying to sell this whole thing where like, if you hire us, you get photos and video, you know? Mm-hmm. And this was like kind of before that was a whole, yeah. before everyone was a photographer and a video guy. <laughs> before you <laughs> yeah. had to be both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I wish we could still do that. Like, I, but Adrian's, he's, he's killing it with all his art and like, do the, what are the things called? Like the linotypes or minute, yeah. whatever those giant He's like doing science. plates are. Yeah. yeah. That's so cool. Looking. It's so cool. And I remember he was super into that when there was this guy doing that stuff in like Yosemite and he was really intrigued by it. And okay. I like remember him being like really sucked in by it. Yeah. And it's cool to see that he's doing it now. And that's like, it's following his passion, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Go back a little bit because I feel like we passed it, but two, six versus the bicycle rockers. Oh, that was just, that was just me. <laughs> just, they, they didn't want anything to do with that. <laughs> like all those dudes were like, please, you're like basically like, please stop. Like we don't want to be in a war. They're all the nicest guys ever. But like the only way I, <laughs> I listened to like a lot of rap, right? And like when I was growing up and the only way I'd seen people do it was like confrontation, you know, like in uh-huh. rap, like beef. So I'm like, well, how do we get publicity? Like these dudes are getting publicity. We'll start a beef with them. <laughs> you know, like if these dudes are getting publicity, we'll just start a beef with them. You know, like, <laughs> and I was just making all this beefs up uh-huh. with like whoever, like whoever wanted to beef. I'd be like, yeah, we'll beef with them too. <laughs> are you guys tight now? Yeah. Uh, writers honorary two six. Sweet. Yeah, we signed him once they broke up. <laughs> <laughs> but they were all, the, those dudes were like really intelligent, and they were making t. Te- those dudes were making merch. Yeah, and like the skills that Haruks had, like they were photos sick. and yeah, everything yeah. about them was. Super and that's why I was like, we got to beef these guys. Uh-huh. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> these dudes are killing it. Like. <laughs> Like if we can get associated with these dudes that are killing it, maybe people think we're killing it. You know, we're actually not, but <laughs> yeah, that's so. Good. We're spray painting our t-shirts, <laughs> but it's I don't know. It's the two different styles. That's what's so cool about it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, there's definitely a very different. Like they're very Canadian, you know, and we were not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, clean. A lot of politeness going on over there, and we were not being polite at all, ever. <laughs> All right, let's go back to some friends. We already we got his. More questions. Mm-hmm. We're going from back. my friends. All right. You can't say Kyle's my friend, remember? Okay, I won't. I'll say that's that's the enemy question for our rivals. Okay, let's see what this one says from. All right, Spomer, you requested some supplemental questions for the Taylor Sage Inside Line podcast, so. Here's a few. Number one, I know I know I had my hand in getting Sage in a lot of trouble with one of his co-sponsors back in the day. So this is a two-part question. Would Sage care to elaborate on that experience in the magazine back in the day? And the second part of the question is, what's the absolute worst bike part today that you have to deal with um number two is also a two-parter let's start with let's start with the first one the magazine thing Uh uh-huh so he's referring so so you asked earlier when my bike career went to filming was when the magazine came out (laughs) (laughs) it's talking about decline yeah and was it the two six issue yeah Uh, what happened oh like john dawson from shram what i (laughs) Cause Kyle and Cam used to hassle everyone be like, you got to hook up Sage, you know, like he needs stuff. He rips like whatever. <laughs> and uh, we went to SRAM tent one time and Dawson was like, look straight at me. And he goes, dude, sorry, bud. You're unmarketable. And I was just like, what does that mean? <laughs> like unmarketable. Like, well, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> and why was it too in your face? Like, cause you, 
I mean, oh, it you was guys pretty had like aggressive. 40s in the photo shoot, right? Yeah, like, the whole thing was like, I thought when I was younger, I really didn't understand like the scope of things, like especially the internet. Like I did not understand the internet. Like if I was typing stuff on the forums, like messing with people, like I thought it was super funny just to mess with people, right? Mm -hmm. Like nothing I was writing was serious or anything, right? And I'm like in my like computer class at high school typing stuff like ha ha ha. <laughs> like these 12 people can see this, but I didn't realize that the internet was forever. And it's like this huge space where everyone in the world could see it, right? I know like with social media, like I never understood that I wasn't just sending stuff to my friends. Hmm. Like I, I did, it took me a really long time to understand that, like that. I wasn't just sending, I wasn't posting this thing for cam to see. I was posting this thing for the whole world to see. Right. Yeah. And with the interview, I thought I was being extremely funny and like clever and witty and like, <laughs> and I wasn't, you know, like I was just being like rude, but I, it definitely brought some things up and like, but I was like going after people's careers and stuff, you know, which is pretty unchill of me. Right. Like. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that definitely like people on the internet were sending me death threats and like, what do you mean? Cause like, well, cause just... I called the, <laughs> cause I called Schley and Vanderham, and, like the Rocky mountain team. Remember I called them the Rocky mountain oysters <laughs> and we were like, those guys got to go. Like we were just being ruthless and like thought we were being funny and I, I'm not that funny. It turns out. <laughs> yeah. The, the spirit's right, but I can totally understand why. Oh, I get, like I read it not, I mean, a couple of years ago, but I was just like, whoa. Yeah. Like, I can't believe I said this. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> yeah, youth, right? That's, that's how we learn. I mean, it was fun at the time. Like, I thought it was great. And I had a run there for about 10 minutes where <laughs> I, I didn't make it to 15, but. <laughs> and so Dawson said you're done. And then was there anyone else involved? I'm trying to think of what he said, my co sponsors. I didn't have any sponsors. Okay. Like I never had sponsors and that's what was a big chip on my shoulder too. Cause I'd see all my homies were getting sponsored and getting picked up. And I was like, why am I not sponsored? You know, like I'm just as sick as everybody else. Like I can do everything everyone else was. And I would, I was just rude about it. You know, like I went about it the wrong way. <laughs> like as an adult now with children and like, I definitely could have went about it a lot better. Yeah. You know? Like, oh, if you're nice, you might get a little more attention from a sponsor. Yeah. Or if I actually ripped. Yeah. <laughs> if you ripped, don't tell yourself short. All right. Let's go to the second half. Well, that was the era when you had to do tricks. Yeah. So to like anyone, any sponsor or anything would look at me and be like, well, what? place does he get at the contest like how many tricks can he do and it's like well he does the sick whips and they're like cool <laughs> you know like what's a whip mm -hmm. you know like and now it's like such a cool i'm like dang dude i'm off i'm off by a couple years here all i gotta do is ride trail and do whips now <laughs> make a comeback <laughs> you should you should <laughs> all right part two of heart um number two is also a two-parter what is the most embarrassing thing that Cameron Zink would not want the world to know about. And the second part is what is the most embarrassing thing that Kyle Strait would not want the world to learn about. Kyle right. sits down to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one I can think of. Okay. But I don't think he's that good. Kyle's not embarrassed. He's not an embarrassed guy. Yeah, and neither is Cam, like dude. Like, yeah. They're badass dudes. Like, what do they have to be embarrassed about? Uh -huh. Like, he's like, yeah, I sit down to pee. Have you seen me run off that cliff? <laughs> you know, like, cool. You should start sitting down. <laughs> do you know why he does? I think it was like when he would get drunk, you know, he wouldn't be able, and he didn't want to miss, like at my parents' house. <laughs> my dad has so For him. cleanliness, yeah. But yeah. Okay. Hygiene thing. All right. We. I, I don't know. Maybe Cam, his mom calls him Cammy, and we, I call him Cammy and stuff, and yeah, I don't think he likes that. Hmm. Okay. But, yeah, I don't think those dudes have much. They're really embarrassed about it. They're pretty badass dudes. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't think so. All right, part three. No surprise, heart's long-winded. Yeah, oh, yeah, obvious. Uh, number three is, how long did you wear glasses as a kid? And we'll make this into a two-parter. Um, what was one of the most defining moments of your eyewear-wearing tenure? And the last question is, 
why does this cat that you gave my kids pee in our sink? <laughs> <laughs> my my glasses thing was when I was a kid growing up. Uh, when I was born, I was born my left eye was blind. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So I I remember being a kid and covering one eye, and then covering the other and I mean like whoa that's weird you know like that's strange and just like shrugging it off because I was like four or five years old right and you're still blind in your left eye then yeah so then I went to kindergarten and they do like the test you know when you yeah. get to kindergarten they're like send me home they're like your kid's blind can't see shit and that was never found out <laughs> no until I was five years old oh, man <laughs> so like all the riding I did as a kid racing BMX a little bit was like blind that's insane. Yeah. Like, and I had no depth perception really like, cause like, yeah, one eyes doesn't work. Right? right. So then I got glasses and I went to the BMX track and I was like, this is what we're doing. <laughs> you know, like I was five and I was like, this is insane. Like I could see it for the first time. I was like, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. Like I've never seen how big this stuff is or like what we're even doing here. Yeah. Like, like I literally couldn't see as a kid and like, yeah. And then like, to the glasses obviously like corrected your vision yeah and like i got and i got these big coke because coke bottle glasses because my dad took me to lens crafters because i was like i don't know maybe we were just poor or something <laughs> like dad, i had these big like old man like jeffrey dot or like ted bundy glasses or something <laughs> you know like sketchy old man glasses and i wore those until i was like 16 hmm. but when i would wear goggles i would couldn't wear glasses, so like all my racing downhill prior to that was blind until I had the surgery. No way. Well, yeah. When did you have surgery then? When I was 25. Well, I got contacts when I was 16, which was pretty sweet. Okay. But then like I had to wear hard contacts because I have astigmatism as well. And so I had these like r real hard contacts, like glass contacts that yeah, you yeah. put in your eye, right? And I only had one set. And when we lived in the motorhome – and we, me and when I went with Grizz, I lost one, oh, and I had to race Mount Seven Psychosis totally blind. Oh, so I rode like for that's I, like the super steep one off the start. Yeah, like the gnarliest track you yeah, can yeah. ride. <laughs> I had to do it the, for like two weeks completely <laughs> blind until I got another set mailed up from my parents. You know, did it just like kind of come back to you that like, man, I don't need to see all that much? Yeah, I, when I ride, I, I, I kind of like everything i do i kind of like blur my eyes hmm. like when i paint or when i ride everything is kind of like this weird dimension almost that i like go into like that's different like i think that's why i'm good at riding a trail without ever seeing it because i i ride right in front of me hmm. you know like when i'm riding i ride six feet in front of me you know i'm not down the trail i'm not thinking about it and i see other dudes that are like three corners ahead right mm -hmm. i think that's why i was kind of a bad racer because like i wouldn't i'd just be riding right in front of my front tire you know mm -hmm. like yeah like i like look i look down okay <laughs> i got in trouble one time when i was a kid I, I was riding a pw50 and i had the thing tapped across the dry lake and i was just staring at the ground and my dad was trying to chase me down i hit a wash and just tomahawk oh man but yeah i, I stare at the ground Okay, interesting. I have a really hard time looking up and not looking at the ground. Mm -hmm. Like I have to, when I ride, I have to tell myself like, look through the corner, like look up, like mm -hmm. still to this day. Yeah. Huh. What about the uh, the cat that pees all over his house? Oh, he uh, does he want two more? Oh, there's two more at the house still. <laughs> Did you give him a cat? <laughs> yeah, dude. We got Where did the, it come from? The ranch. We got my wife's like, oh, this cat that just showed up at our ranch. We need to take it home. We bring it home. Things pregnant. <laughs> Has five kittens, I think, um, and we get rid of them all. Like we got not get rid of them. Like that sounds rude, <laughs> mean, but we like I was like, yeah, hallelujah, gave them away. Yeah, we gave them away, and then two weeks later, cat's pregnant. We didn't have time to even get this thing neutered, dude. It just went out, got rowdy around the neighborhood. <laughs> Comes back, six more cats, dude. <laughs> So then we pawned two off on Scott. <laughs> and he actually took them. <laughs> yeah, his wife yeah, and his okay. kids. Uh -huh. They fell in love with him. Yeah. I was like, yeah, so there we go. You guys want four? <laughs> so we got rid of And then that cat that we brought back from the ranch decided it doesn't like us anymore and moved on. We don't, and it lives at the neighbor's house, I think. 
Oh, weird. Yeah. Is this a gone. drifter cat, dude? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Last uh, last phone a friend coming in hot. There's actually two. Here's the first one. Sage, my first question for you is really on behalf of all mountain bikers. And that is, why you got to be such a dick, man? <laughs> <laughs> and the second question I got for you is, what are your thoughts on Strava culture in mountain biking? Let it go. First off, I don't really think I'm a dick. <laughs> like, I, I'm just truthful, you know? Like, when I don't have, like, a lot of a, a fil- I don't. There's, I, there's no bullshit with you. Yeah, I don't have much of a filter, you know, like a lot, like a lot of stuff that comes out of my mouth surprises me, you know, (laughs) (laughs) so like, like, so sometimes is it can, I mean, especially with Grizz, like I'm on Grizz's case pretty hard, you know, like I've known him for so long, like he probably thinks I'm a dick, but, (laughs) and via text, I'm a dick for sure, because the way I speak doesn't translate into text. (laughs) Not a lot of LOLs and like heart emojis. <laughs> yeah, like there's no heart emojis for sure. <laughs> and like, I, and I'm like kind of short with text and stuff. Like T Mac told me one time, he's like, "Dude, you're not funny in text. Like, stop trying to be funny." <laughs> he's like, "You're just rude." <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and I with Strava culture, I, I don't. I've heard people like gripe about it, but I honestly avoid myself of mountain bike culture, like in general. Yeah, I just don't really like mountain bike culture at all yeah. like it, i don't like talking about mountain biking i like i just like to ride you know okay all right so you're saying you don't like mountain bike culture and all that stuff Hart says why do legends like zinc and street use them as their spirit guide and he needs that you need to know that Hart uses you as a spirit guide too a spirit guide yeah like That's you, you kind of know like what's cool and is it just because you happen to mountain bike but no, if, if, if that's true, and like, uh, I don't think I know what's cool, but I know what I think is cool. And just having the conviction and believing in what you think is cool, I think it's what they latch on to. Not latch on to, but like, and growing up in Orange County, you grow up in Costa Mesa, like every surf brand is there. You, you grow up around cool, basically like yeah. that. Everyone, everyone I know is trying to be as cool as they could their whole lives. And like, that's literally all culture is in Newport beach. Costa Mesa is trying to be cool. Right. Like having a fancy car. Like, and my dad was always taking me to really cool stuff like car shows and you know, like stuff. Other kids things were, with style things with style. Yeah. My dad was a painter. So like, yeah, there's. I just had really cool influences, you know. Mm-hmm. Tell everyone about your painting. Like, are you still painting? Sometimes when I have to get through something, me and McCall saw an alien. <laughs> Come on, what do you mean? Like out in the Green River or something? <laughs> no, we were driving down the road. <laughs> what do you mean you saw an alien? <laughs> I thought about it so much that I had to paint it. Like, we were, okay, you want me to tell a story? Of course. All right, because I've been wanting to tell people this story, but I don't want people to think I'm crazy. That's You're going to be crazy, so let's hear it. Anyway. All right, we were, well, we were driving, so we're driving through the middle of the desert on the way back from Crankworks, and I'm just staring out the window, right? And this flash, like the trippiest thing you've ever seen, like a perfect, exactly what you think like a flash would look like, like a, di- like a diamond like mm-hmm. this, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then this dot went across the sky, like unexplainably fast. Like I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out in my head. Right. And we drove and it lit the whole inside of the car. Like you ever throw magnesium in a fire or something. It just like turned super white, hot, like white (laughs) light. Right. Mm -hmm. And the whole inside of the car did that. And then me and McCall drove down the road for 20 minutes, just not talking. Where in the desert? Somewhere in Oregon. Okay. And we just literally didn't talk for 20 minutes. And then McCall goes, did you see that? Shut and up. I was like, yeah, dude, I saw that. So it's like, not maybe it wasn't an alien, but it was an unidentified flying object, dude. I have no <laughs> idea what it was, but like, it was wild. Man. And so you have to paint this to get it to just like process it? Just to get it out of my head. Like, I just thinking about it so much. And then I just, I did this painting for like a week. Like, it was, it was like bugging me. Like, I was just like, what, what, like, how did that thing go across the sky so fast? What was that? Like, so then I just painted it and then I was like, all right, I'm all right with it now. Like whatever it was, like I can go about my day now. <laughs> that's, 
Will you send me pictures of the painting? Yeah. What's it look like? Uh, I mean, I think it's like somewhere like in a garbage. Like, I don't keep them. Like, I don't like them, my paintings. Why not? I just don't. Like, when I finish them, I just finish them and then I give, either I'll give them away or I'll just get rid, or I'll paint over them or I'll get rid of them. Hmm. I just like don't like looking at it. I don't like looking at the past really, like photos or anything. Yeah. Do you keep any old stuff like that? No, I have my shreddy or what is that what your award to call? <laughs> yeah, for video of the year. Yeah, uh-huh. I've got yeah. that. And I've got this foam finger, uh, Dale Earnhardt foam finger that Scott gave me. Uh huh. Yeah, but I don't have much memorabilia. Like you asked me yesterday if I was going to bring some memorabilia. I was like, no, I don't keep anything. Like <laughs> I know. I'm like, dude, bring props. You can set it on the thing back there. And, like, yeah, I'll bring the rubber chicken. And you oh, I should have brought. I have an old L frame, a, a BMX bike, that one of my first ones, and oh, do cool. a trip on how small it is. Okay. Yeah. But that's, but, yeah. Do you paint because your dad's a painter? Like, is that where you learned it? Yeah, for sure. Well, my dad would be painting helmets. So when I was a kid, when I was racing BMX, everyone had a custom painted helmet, right? And my dad, we couldn't afford to do that. My dad's a sick artist. So he's like, bought an airbrush. And he's like, I can paint a helmet. Because that's kind of the type of person my dad is. He's like, well, I could do that, you yeah. know? like, And that he instilled that in me, you know? Like, if if you want to do something, just do it. Like, don't wait on somebody to show you how or what. Just figure it out, right? Like, you mess stuff up, whatever. Figure it out. So then he painted me a helmet, and then people started liking it, and he started painting more and more. And then at a point in time when I was racing BMX, he was painting me a helmet for every national, which was like once a month, right? Whoa. So, like, every race I had a new helmet, which is pretty sick. Dude, like, being, like, sick. seven or eight years old, and you have a new helmet every race. Yeah. And then What, what helmets were they? They D2s or Echoes. something? Echoes. Okay. This is way pre D2. Okay, okay. Yeah, this is like 93, 94. All right. Yeah, this is like, these are like, you pick these helmets up, they feel like bowling balls. They're heavy. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine having this thing on my head at five years old. And my dad would paint them so many times that they would get heavier and heavier, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that was classic. But then he started painting like a bunch of dudes' helmets, like Choo Choo Charlie Townsend, like, all these pro like the Robinson team, he would paint like oh. the power light team. He'd paint like, I mean, and then there was a point in time. I remember when our whole garage was just filled with helmets that he was painting. And then that was kind of it. Like he got to a point where he was like, this is too much. Cause it was his second job. He would come home from work cause he works on boats in the Harbor. He would come home from work and then work all night painting helmets. And that's how he funded us going to nationals and stuff. Huh, okay. Yeah. And he would get parts. Like he painted a bunch of helmets for answer and would get parts for my bikes. And it was all, my dad was hustling, dude. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sounds like it, dude. That's super cool. Yeah. What's he do? Like, he fixes boats? He's a yacht technician. <laughs> that's his, dude, that's, so that's what he calls himself. Really, so. really? <laughs> but he just, yeah, he does like uh, sport fishing boats. He he runs like wires and he's the man down in the harbor. You go, you, you go on a drive with Jay Sage and his bus down in Newport, you, you get waved at a lot. All right. He knows everybody down there. <laughs> dude, that's sick. Yeah. All right. You're a dad now. Yeah. What's it like? wild yeah yeah like i was saying about the first time i thought about get those dudes getting hurt out there when when i had kids was the first time i thought about myself getting hurt mm. and thinking about like actually crashing and like what if i died you know like mm. like never thought that before right like never had that thought gone through my mind like what if i die like it was always like let's get it yeah. whatever it is like yeah. you know and then when So it kind of spooked me out for a bit, like a year or two. And that was when I was going through like all the finger stuff and everything. So like I was in a very weird place already. And yeah, it was kind of, it was hard at first for me, like to, to get over it all. It was like almost like a post, what do the, what do the women have? Like that probably sounds so like postpartum depression kind of thing. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like to an extent where I was like. I like, yeah. And I was dealing with my finger falling off and all that. Yeah. So like, what, tell that story. Uh, I had a tumor and so I had it in high school. And so there's two arteries in your finger mm-hmm. and I had a tumor in one artery in high school. So they cut the tumor out and, cr- uh, clamped each side and then it grew back. And so they were like, well, this is after years of like running it. Cause I, after they cut my finger off, when I went to the, when I was in 
post surgery, I had a memory and I remember going to a doctor's appointment where the doctor told me that they were going to cut my finger off. But this was like seven years before. Hmm. And I had just compartmentalized it and was like, no, nah, sorry, bro. Like, peace out. Uh-huh. See you on the other side. Like, uh, you're not cutting my finger off. Like, that'll never happen. And then I went through, yeah, all that. Like, I was on Medi-Cal, so I was going to like a ton of doctors and appointments were getting messed up. And it was just getting extended to where I was in so much pain because it was at a point, the tip of my finger had turned black, okay. like gangrenous. Yeah. And it's your index finger. Yeah. My index finger. Yeah. And it had turned black and gotten fully gangrenous. So it was basically like falling off. Right. Yeah. And I got the final surgery or if the final doctor I got to this guy, Dr. Dow, I kind of hate him. He's kind of a prick, but he was a good <laughs> surgeon. <laughs> That's what counts. But he put the he put the MRI up on the thing, dude. I'll never forget it. And he looked at it and he kind of like did a double take. And he just walked over to me and he pointed out my hand. And he said, Do you want your finger cut off here or here? And pointed out my knuckle and pointed out like halfway down my metacarpal. Dude. That's what he said to me. You want your finger cut off here or here? And I was like, I don't know. Can I go home and Google it, dude? Like, yeah. It's a big decision. <laughs> a huge, huge decision for me to make here on the spot, guy, you know? He's like, all right, set another appointment up and we can do it. This is wild. You want to hear a wild one? Yeah. All right. <laughs> this is a classic one. Okay. So I'm in like excruciating pain. Like the nerve is out in the air. Like imagine like your tooth broken, but it's on the tip of my finger, right? Jeez. And my legs are shaking at night. I can't, I haven't slept in, I looked like a junkie, right? Probably. So I go to the, just because of all the pain that you're dealing with in your, pain. yeah, I was just dealing with just an incredible amount of pain at all times. Like nonstop. It was like thro- It was throbbing and like just horrible. Mm. And I, I go to the doctor and I'm like, all right, I want you to cut it off the metacarpal. Like he goes, okay, we'll, we'll set the surgery up for three weeks from now. And I was like, can't wait three weeks, dude. You gotta like, that's too long. Like mm. I can't do it. Like I, I physically can't make it three more weeks. I'm in too much pain. And how old are you? This was 2018. Okay. So then he's like, well, I asked him, I'm like, can I have some pain meds? Cause I hadn't taken any, right. Cause I was not going to take any pain medicine. That was my whole thing, right? I'm not going to take pain meds. I'm not going to become a junkie. Yep. Cause I would have for sure became dependent on it. Cause when I had one, I was like, Oh my God. Like, <laughs> you know, like I can make like, sure, yeah. yeah, you know? But he, he goes, no, we're not going to give you any medicine. Like, you're a junkie. And I was just like, I lost it. Like, lost it. And I grabbed him by the shirt and slammed him up against the wall. And I was like, you're in the healthcare industry. You don't care about people. And just like, no. yeah, I, like and this little tiny dude, Dr. Dow. And I had him like up against the wall. And I could see like fear in his eyes. And then that's when I like kind of snapped out of it a little bit. Yeah. And I was like, this ends today. And I was like kicked my way out of the door and <laughs> there's this poor lady that was setting up all the appointments named Carla and I blow the door down and I'm like who is Carla like and the, all these ladies at the desk like look at this lady Carla and I was like I hope sometime in your life you suffer you know like I was losing my mind right I was totally crazy like yeah, absolutely yeah. lost my mind at this point in time right because of just the perpetual issues with the nerve on your finger perpetual pain yeah non-stop pain for seven years you know like Jeez. and it had progressively gotten worse in that year i had done rampage like that's what midge said he's like that landing killed your finger man he's like that's where that was the end of it because i packed this one big landing yeah. like all day long and that was when my finger was like all right we're tapping out here dude and that was october right so then i got it cut off in march so I did like from October to March was like excruciating pain. And uh, you never got pain meds for it? No. And I was like sleeping like an hour or two a night and I was mowing lawns then because like I'd gotten to a point where I couldn't feel creative anymore. Like I couldn't, I'd sit at the computer and my hand would throb and I'd try to edit and I was just like, couldn't, like I couldn't. Because when you're being creative, you need your mind there and you need to be able to like come up with ideas and do things. And I just physically couldn't. So I was like, I, and I convinced myself that I didn't want to do it anymore. I hated filming. I hated mountain biking. I never wanted to ride again. Mm-hmm. Like I just had convinced because I couldn't. Right. So then I had to convince myself that I didn't want to. And then so I started mowing lawns with this dude, Jimmy Breen, who's 
I knew from ra- growing up racing BMX. Mm-hmm. And I, there was one day I was mowing this lawn and it was cold out. It was like January and I was just crying, pushing the mower, just crying. And the, and like this for this Mexican dude, this fool just stared at me and he's like, you good fool? And I was like, no, man, I'm not. And I just kept mowing. Like, oh, man, really? <laughs> yeah. One day I hit my finger on the blower and passed out. Just because the pain was so big? Yeah. My legs gave out and I woke up like on my back. And then Jimmy was like, dude, you're purple, bro. We got to like, you, we got to go home. Like you need to go to the doctor. Like you need to get that thing sorted out. And so when was that compared to? getting it sorted out like three or four months before Jeez. yeah so then so that day after i blew out of the doctor i was like this ends today you know like mm-hmm. not dealing with this anymore and i had called my buddy who's a construction worker and i was like what's the best way you've seen somebody cut their finger off <laughs> really what <laughs> like because he's in construction he's seen it a bunch or something i that was the thought that was going through my head i was like if anybody knows how to cut a finger off this guy does you know like <laughs> <laughs> so I, I walked from the doctors to my parents like pumping myself up like just follow through just follow i'll never forget like this walk right like it was an insane walk i was like if you follow through like you'll be all good if you if you wuss out and you don't follow through like you're gonna bleed out and die you know like and i was like and you gotta stick it in a frying pan or something after like i was like fully like ready to cut this thing off got the chop like, saw out. you're thinking like you're going to cut your own finger off yeah i got the chop saw out I had the chop saw out at my parents' house. It was like plugged in. I was ready to do it. I'm, Shut up. I swear to God, dude. And my wife came because she was at the doctor when I had the explosion. And she knew like where I, where I was going, I guess, you know, like, and she got to my parents' house and she's like, she knew I was like irate and like insane and lost my mind. And I, like, there was no talking me out of it. Like I was going to cut my finger off. Mm-hmm. So then she's like, well, I have the kids and I can't drive it to the hospital right now. So like, let me call your dad. And he'll come drive you to the hospital. And I was like, yeah, yeah, good idea. I call my dad. I'm like, hey, dad, can you come? Like, I'm going to cut my finger off and I need to ride to the hospital. And he's like, you're going to do what, bro? Like, shut <laughs> Yeah. And he's like, nah, dude, like, just wait for me. I'll come, like, deal with it. And then he went to the doctor's office and, like, laid into the guy. He's like, this kid's at the house, like, going to cut his finger off, dude. Like, you need to set this surgery up. Yeah. And the doctor's like, yeah, if he comes in and apologizes to me then I'll set it up at a better date or something, you know? So I, then after it, my dad came home and talked me off the ledge of cutting my finger off, you know? So then they made me go. Plus, dude, I don't know a lot about that stuff. Like <laughs> when a chop saw be a pretty dirty ass cut compared to like something sharp and straight. <laughs> well, I thought about doing it with loppers, but that would like yeah. crush it. Yeah. And uh, like my, I, my buddy was like, I think chop saw dude, like, and he was like, are, you're not going to do that, are you? And I was oh just like, goodness. I might, you know, like, don't Ugh. don't test me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and the, when I was at the, the hospital getting the surgery, the lady's like, you almost did what? And I was like, yeah, she's like, you'd have bled out, dude. Like, when we cut into it, it yeah. just squirted because it was so much pressure built up because it was trying to push. Wow, really? Yeah, and the yeah, tumor yeah. was stopping all, like, all blood flow, and yep. it was so much pressure. She's like, you'd have bled out in five minutes. Like, mm. you had no chance for you to cut that thing off. Yeah. I'm glad you didn't. <laughs> Still, that's insane. And so like when you have the surgery was like was it freedom to not have it there? Did oh, it I felt funny? so good. Like, yeah. Oh man, I got out of the surgery and I was like sitting in the post op and I was just like it just felt like a weight off my shoulders. Mm. Like and uh, there's like obviously pain, but it was like a different kind of pain. And I was like, I love this pain. This feels great. Like yeah. it feels like it's scratching an itch, you know, like it was gnarly. And then, <laughs> then I had one post-op appointment. That's all I got with Medi-Cal, right? No, no physical therapy, nothing. Just one post-op. And the doctor's like, oh, I did such a good job, you know, blah, 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 like <laughs> playing God. And he's like, you know, like you never know what people are going through. Uh, my wife had a minor surgery that day. And, you know, you never know what people are going through. I'm like, you didn't know what I was going through, bro. Like, <laughs> For real. So, like, when he's like, do you want to cut off here or here? Like, he had a rough day. And he's talking about, like, your finger that's destroying yeah. your life. <laughs> and then he's like, this is what, hey, yeah, this is the kicker. He goes, you know, I've been getting a lot of bad Yelp reviews. And I was just hoping you could leave a good one for me. No way. I'm like, dude, no if way. I start typing, it's not going to be good. <laughs> Like, you don't want me to type, dude. Just... And now you know this for the internet. It's forever. It's not just for a couple people, right? Yeah. <laughs> dude, that's nuts. Wild situation. Yeah, does it... 
like are you used to it not being gone i guess it's not like hey i had all four fingers like fully functional and then one day one's gone like it's it was a yeah there was that de- like there was definitely a period of time where i just didn't use it and so i was like sort of used to it but there's like so many things in life that you don't realize you use your index finger for like putting your hand in your pocket like mm-hmm. you open your pocket with your index finger like when you reach for a car door you, your index finger is the first one to grab it like i would reach for a car door and almost fall down you know like wow, crazy, yeah like yeah. just weird stuff that like and it it irked me like it it's really hard to deal with like that whole situation. Like I couldn't imagine a leg or like an arm or something. Cause you could, I can feel my finger right now. We're talking about it. It feels like it's there and it feels like it's stuck like a raptor claw or something, you know? Interesting. Like the nerve, however it's. Yeah. They tied the nerve to the other bone. So it just feels like it's like stuck like this, like all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of, and when we talk about it, it feels like like Pinocchio's nose or something. Like I, I can feel it growing. When I'm not talking about it or thinking about it, I don't feel it. But as soon as we start talking about it, it like grows and comes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to like. No. <laughs> make it feel weird. No, no, it's fine. I do. I've dealt with it enough now. Yeah. And like, now I've gotten so used to it, and I can ride my bike again, and like just all like riding riding was i was really really scared to ride because my index finger is my front brake right yeah and i had braked with that finger my entire life so i was like how am i going to relearn holding on with only two fingers now Mm -hmm. and i didn't realize how much weight you put on your palm like on not your palm like the top of your palm like Mm -hmm. on your bottom of your finger so the first like i just decided i was like okay i'm gonna learn how to ride my bike again because i can't like I literally can't do it when I try to ride. I couldn't manual. I couldn't bunny hop. I couldn't do anything. My hand was like not strong, you know? So I was like, how did I learn how to ride a bike? I rode curbs and I jumped curbs. So I Hucker gave me a BMX bike and I just started jumping curbs Really? and like manualing curbs. And I would get arm pump riding like a hundred yards down the street. And then I just because the grip is so different. Yeah. Just trying to hold on to it. And then, so I rode like that for like a year before I, and then the first time I ever rode a mountain bike again was that Yamaha thing you had me do. Wow, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, it was like a life-changing moment. No way. Yeah. Huh. Well, cool. Yeah. Glad I could help out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You know, know. No, you helped out more than you ever know. Like, uh, when I went to that thing, I didn't even know if I could even ride a bike. Yeah. I was like, I have no idea if I can do this. And for, like, probably a year or so, I would think about it as I was coming down the trail, and I would have to take my hand off the brake and to hold on mm. and then when i'd have to come into corners i'd have to take my finger off and break but now i my hands and stuff are strong enough that i can actually ride and keep my fingers on the brakes wow. and not think about it like yeah it feels good huh dude that's dope you've adapted yeah yeah i mean this is gonna be hot in la you know this is coming right like this is the next plastic surgery what do you <laughs> this is the next big lips <laughs> Because of the style. Factor. Look how cool that is. <laughs> look at that thing, dude. That's a 12 inch finger. <laughs> it looks, it's crazy to look at, like that length right there. Yeah. Dr. Dow, what a what a nice guy. Yeah. Leave him good Yelp reviews. <laughs> yeah. Give him a Yelp. <laughs> that's, that's nuts. Oh, man. All right. We got, we got some more photo friends. <laughs> oh, geez. I thought those were over. That was insane. Like, I had no idea the extent of that. Like I'd heard from people like they'd say he just pumped, he's back on the bike. A lot of people don't know the extent of it because I don't have social media. Yeah. Right? Let's go into there. Phone a friend can wait a sec. Like, why aren't you on social media? I such a deep question for me. Like, you know, <laughs> so I've I've had social media a few times and I just had one like a couple of weeks ago. Like, cause like my, an Instagram account? Yeah, like yeah. I made an Instagram account because I was like, Oh, I want to see what's out here in the world. And I get on there and I go back to my old ways of like being a hater. And I don't like that about myself. And I don't want to, I have no, like, you know, your parents say, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything. Yeah. Well, I'm on the don't say anything. You know, when I go on there, I have nothing nice to say to it. Like, <laughs> this sounds mean or like sounds crappy, but like no one's doing anything on there. That's really that cool. Like I was there for the neural disorder stuff. Like this sounds like an old man or whatever, but like (laughs) the stuff those dudes were doing was so gnarly and it's as gnarly as anything anyone's doing now. And it's like, I don't need to see this guy do a nose wheelie 
and like stop in and chug his new energy drink or you know like like i don't care like yeah. and i think it's a waste of anyone's time like there's other things to do in this life i have two kids i don't have time to sit there staring at the phone like yeah. wondering what everyone else is doing i don't want people to know what i'm doing like i don't care to be like oh this is what i'm doing today this is this is the cheeseburger i had like it's just not my thing you know like mm -hmm. I, I'm not like, go, I could have go, I, I thought about this question cause I knew you were going to ask this mm -hmm. and like, I'm not like speaking the way I was hoping I would about it, Yeah, I, but I've been there a thousand times. I know what you mean, but like, keep, keep talking it out. Yeah. It's just like, I almost don't even like my friends when I look on there, you know, yeah. cause they're like my best buddies and stuff like are these super athletes and they're selling things and it just looks lame to me. And I'm like, uh, and it makes me think differently of them kind of, and I don't want to, I'd rather just hang out with people and think of them that way. I don't want my vision of a person to be clouded by whatever BS they're putting on the internet. Yeah. Can you separate the fact that like that stuff is work for them now more than before? Okay. Before I was just like, you guys are all so lame. Like, you know, like, I was like, look at what you guys are posting. Like, you guys are dumb, dude. Yeah. Like, this is goofy. Like, but now I get that's how they make their living and that's what they have to do. But I don't, I still can't process how people take that in and they're like, yeah, this is cool. This is like, this is what I want to see. You know? Yeah. I'm the same way. Like, I don't look at Instagram at all. Like, I'll do stuff for work, obviously. But yeah, like, when I, take a few seconds and actually cruise and scroll through like I, it's hard to find any value in any of that stuff like i don't yeah. feel fulfilled by any of it and I, I totally know what you mean about you can get crusty and be like oh that's lame it could have been cooler this oh and year. it's like i see people commenting and stuff like sometimes i'll look at like some stuff every now and then and i'll see like comments from dudes and i'm like that guy doesn't write hard emojis you know, like that guy's, you know, that guy's full of it on here. You know, like it's just fake. The whole thing mm. is fake is what it comes down to. And I don't like fake stuff. Like I want it to be as authentic as possible. Like everything I do, like everything that I'm around, the people I'm with, I want it to be authentic and real. And I don't think anything on there is, you know? Mm. Yeah. It's all just this perceived image of what you want people to think you are. All right. But like how different is it than setting up beef with bicycle rockers no hey this if we're on social media 15 years ago i got a million followers okay <laughs> uh -huh. you know yeah yeah like would it, no i would not have pulled back i would have been going off and controversy kind of kills it on that thing because everyone is being so like on their p's and q's that anyone who starts to actually be real gets a ton of following i feel like you know mm. and yeah i would have I would have went wild on there. I would have been banned from everything. <laughs> like I would have been banned from the whole industry. Like no one, <laughs> but I'd have the most followers, you know? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. And that's, what's funny is if, if they banned you and then you had the most followers, they would come running to your door, knocking on it, which is, that's what bugs me the most. Right? Mm -hmm. Like these people don't want you until you got all these followers or you've accumulated and just the word followers right like i never it's like you're a cult leader yeah like my followers yeah and i'm not a follower like i like you know in my i don't want to be a follower of anyone so mm -hmm. like that was the whole thing like someone's like who do you follow I was like no one you know like when i had an instagram i was like i don't follow anybody dude that's so good it's like myspace top eight you know it's like cam kyle uh -huh. but i yeah I don't know. Social media is just this weird world that I don't need to be in. You know, like everyone's like, Oh, you should have social media for your business and stuff. And I've been able to make enough like strong relationships in the industry and in different industries and stuff that I don't have to have one. And I'm also like very glad that I don't have to have one, you know, like I can just go about my life. Mm -hmm. And I see, I've always been really egged out by people talking to like their girlfriends on the phone at the trails and like stuff like that, you know, used to really bug me super bad. And when I see people like hanging out at the spot and they're like scrolling, I'm just like, you turds get off your phones, you know, like, <laughs> like an old man, like let's go rip, you know? Uh, yeah. Like, Hey, you're outside, like experience outside. Like, have you guys seen this? Like, yeah. have you guys looked around? Yeah. It's insane. <laughs> yeah. Do 
What do you think about it impacting what you do for a career, like being, you know, filming, editing, video stuff? Does it have an impact on what you do with the projects that you've done in the past and maybe the things that you'd hope to do in the future? Like, are those just like bigger projects, just not something that happen anymore because everyone wants a reel? Yeah, to an extent. Um, like the, the the majority of videos I make are Instagrams and reels and things like that more than anything, but they're usually stem from a larger project. Mm -hmm. So I'll sell a bigger project to someone like a seven to 10. I like to make seven to 10 minute like feature shorts. And I really like to make videos about people and kind of like in, uh, immerse myself in whatever they're doing and try to like show these people as authentically as possible. And then, after that is done, then I can pull cool Instagrams out of it. And mm -hmm. like, so like the one I'm doing right now, this guy's building a, a race car. And then from that, we've got commercials out of the, the show we're making, you know? Hmm. So, yeah. And so this is not bike industry. No. What is it? It's WD 40. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, this guy, Trad, who's Kyle, the Duke's mechanic, he's building a Hummer like that's going to be a chase truck. Okay. And then we're going to film. So I'm filming it, filming the build out of the chase truck and then filming him, uh, chase in Baja, Whoa, that's, which would be really cool. Yeah. That's sick. How's, how's the difference working in an industry like that versus, you know, mountain bikes? Is it, you get paid. <laughs> <laughs> Is the budget bigger? Is it different? Are there higher expectations? Like, I mean, for myself, especially like if I'm, I'm making videos for like WD 40, it's something you've seen your whole life. Every dad on earth tells you like, that's what you use to kill a squeak. You know, yeah. like <laughs> I'm going to try to bring my a game, like do it as good as I possibly can. If I'm, I mean, no matter what, I kind of only have one speed, right? Like I can't, which sucks. Like sometimes <laughs> <That> it, <sucks. laughs> it does suck sometimes because you'll get a job and it will be like, not for that much, but I can't like lowball the job and do a crappy job i just can't do that and i don't want people to think that i can't well i don't want people to think i made something crappy yeah you know like i want everything i ever make to be good and like something people want to watch and yeah so that whole one speed thing really gets you in the bike industry because you'll end up doing a lot of really good projects for no money <laughs> are you still doing that because you like bikes or the people you're yeah, working for with? Sure. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. No, it's like, it's gotten... I know you're not saying like no money at all, but... No, it's gotten way better as I get older, especially. When I was young, when you're young, like, who's going to pay a kid to like go out and dork around with his buddies? For you sure, know? yeah. Like, so as, I, like, as I've gotten older and I've proved what I can do and like, it's gotten a lot better. Like, I actually make a living out of it. And it's the relationships that you have with the people. Like, yeah. They can trust you and you know them and having that history... Yeah, I kind of pride myself in being able to like kind of roll into any situation and kick it with whoever. Like whatever dudes I'm filming, I can just roll in and kind of be a fly on the wall. I really like to film that fly on the wall kind of pulled back style mm -hmm. and cuz I I raced and I grew up racing and I didn't want like I wouldn't want someone shoving the camera in my face and asking me questions before I rode and like or like a race car driver, like those dudes don't want me shoving a camera in their face and yeah. asking them questions, you know? So I have to come up with a different way of filming and that's how I developed my style, right? Of this pulled back, like, uh, yeah. Yeah, kind of like voyeuristic style. Voyeur, that's degree. the word I was looking for, yeah. voyeuristic, yeah. Sure, yep. All right, back to topic. Did we get this one from Grizz already? Yeah, we did this one from Grizz. Here's another one from Grizz. All right, there, and the third bonus question is, what are your thoughts on the long-term, just what are your thoughts on the impact of Gen Z in mountain biking, and where do you think they're going to take it? This kind of relates to that question you asked about how they don't build and stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I think no matter what, there's going to be like a cool kid out of the crew that's like, no, nah, we got to go dig, guys. They're like, you know, and then the like – the whole Gen Z millennials, like all that, I, I don't really understand it that much. Like, 
it's just the same as when we were growing up and our parents were like, those kids don't work hard, you know, like <laughs> for sure. Like it's never changed. And it's going to be like that for the end of time. Right. Like yeah. everyone always are going to be like the, the younger generation sucks, but I think they have it easy. Like they, they never had to ride a rigid bike down the kamikaze or something, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, right. Like they have it easy. The bikes now are rocket ships. I didn't have a bike from 2012 until this one that I got now. And it's like, it blows my mind what this thing can do. What are you on? A Canyon. Like a Spectral or something? A Strive. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. A 29er. And the last bike, the last time I rode a 29er before this was like some Trek XC 29er that was not made to rip. And yeah. I was like, 29ers suck. Like, I will never ride one of those. And then I get on this bike and I'm like, whoa, this thing's a race car, mm-hmm. you know, like. And I'm a hero and I just got, and I just, I just survived like all these sketchy moments. Cause my bike just rolled over everything, you know, and that's why you see so many people getting into mountain biking now is because these bikes make it accessible. Yeah. Like prior to it, you had to be willing to lay on the ground on a regular basis or like really understand your bike and know how to ride the thing. Right. Like you couldn't just jump on an old bike and ride down a trail. You, you die. Yeah. Like, but these new ones are just monster trucks, big old tires, uh, tubeless, mind blowing. <laughs> <Mind-blowing. laughs> yeah, I mean, I come from forty pounds of pressure. I go out there with twenty eight in my tires. I'm like, this thing rips. Yeah, it grips on everything. Yeah, huh? <laughs> mind blowing. That's so good. <laughs> oh man. Oh, uh, so what Scott asked, what my what part I didn't ooh, like. Oh yeah, yeah. What's that one? I don't know. I must have said something to him, right? For him to ask such a specific question, like when I was ranting one day on the trail. Yeah, it seems like it. Suspension, drivetrain. I don't know. I'm not that into like electronic stuff, really. Like, I don't need to charge. My, I'm not smart enough to even charge my camera batteries half the time. Like, I don't, <laughs> like imagine I'm trying to go ride and my bike's not charged. It would melt me, dude. I wouldn't be able to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, put a cable on this thing, dude. For sure. Yeah. Talk about your camera kit that you're running right now. Like, do you own your stuff? Do you rent stuff? Like- yeah. I have a C70 that I use for like the bigger stuff. And then for like McCall's blog things, I have a, this 4K like handy cam. And then I shoot a lot of Super 8. And that's, that's my kit. Yeah. I've got two lenses. I got a 7200 and a 50 kind of all you need right that's all i've ever had yeah yeah uh-huh. i had a wide for a little while but i slipped and broke it <laughs> but i I don't know i just like i i've always kind of felt like if you're limited you come up with stuff for sure right like i see dudes and they have the sickest gear and the all these dope like focus pullers and everything and all their shots look the same like because when you get to that level there you're you're trying to film to that level right and you're trying and you think okay that level is to go super tight super slow and pull focus like i'm gonna try to be clay porter and it's like well there's only one clay porter you know like we got they, we all have to find our other song because clay's got that pretty down you know like <laughs> <laughs> so it's like i had to come up with what what is my thing like brandon one time told me i was the best worst you know like i'm the best at being the worst filmer you know like like i'm not like a pro- Why? just because like you're your gear and stuff like it seems like you take it casually but you really don't yeah yeah because i like kind of don't really care that like i care but like i also like want to just make sure that at the day is fun so that the video feels fun and like i don't want the rider to be bummed out because we had to stop and like i had to set something up or something i just want things to flow and go fast and work and like feel like mountain biking right because that's why i do it because i love mountain biking and i wanted to portray that right yeah the fun part of it yeah yeah interesting that's i see what he's saying and i gravitate towards stuff you do in style like that you know just yeah walking out on the hill with a thousand pounds of gear to get a berm shot, I'm like, no, I'd rather right. see people. And when I was growing up, do. like I watched Krusty, right? Krusty Demons. That was what I watched. Uh-huh. I didn't like I never watched mountain bike movies. I never watched Chain Smoke. I never watched any of that stuff until Cameron showed me all that stuff when we were way older. But when I was growing up, the only movies that I had 
was SMP disturbing the peace and all the crusty demons. So I just had these old moto videos and they had these sections in with the dudes would be partying, right? Like, but it'd be like three or four shots. And I just wanted to know what it was like when they weren't riding, you yeah. know, like that's all I ever wanted was to know what, like what it was like behind the scenes. So when I started filming, I was like, I'm going to show people what it's like behind the scenes, you know? Mm. And that was like, we did that one video with Brandon at Crankworks for long, a strand video for long years when he won Crankworks that year. And I just followed him around and just filmed him like all day long. Cause I was like, I can show Brandon. He's the sickest dude in the world, right? Like, obviously, like it's very easy to film Brandon. Mm -hmm. He's the man. But like, no one's ever talking about Seminok. Yeah, yeah, Seminok. And it's, but I was like, no one's ever seen Brandon. Like, and he's great, mm -hmm. you know. But he's so guarded with everything that he is. Like, I was like, I want to show Brandon. Like, what is Brandon like? You know, like, and I feel like I got a bit of it out of him, right? But like, also, I want to make sure that be true to him and keep him guarded to an extent. But like that one really opened my eyes to the whole, maybe I can just like basically make vlogs, mm -hmm. you know, like this was before vlogs, but I was like, maybe I just make these videos that are super long and it's just showing what's happening and we can watch the whole day unfold. And people, and I think people will watch this. And I remember turning the video in and, and more than was like, 13 minutes you know he's like what <laughs> you know because this was two minute videos this is what you made back then yeah yeah for you know sure. like uh -huh. you, you made a two minute two and a half minute video max yeah like no attention span type and i was like here's a 13 minute video and they're like you're insane sage like what are you <laughs> what are you even thinking like and then i was like this is what i want to do you know like i want to make long videos and that was kind of almost the demise of that whole shram thing we were kind of having a little bit of creative differences with all of that stuff. Mm. And then did they go for the 13 minute length? Yeah. There, well, there's a, I made a few in a row. Yeah. Like I was like, no, I'm not going to listen to you. You know, like <laughs> I'm going to do whatever I want. You know, like I know what's cool. You don't like, which is so dumb. I had a cush job and like, it was, it was sick. Yeah. Like and I could have probably done it forever, but I also needed to like grow in a sense and, and get thrown to the curb and, not thrown to the curb, but like after that, I had to find out how to get my own job. Cause I, before that I had worked for new world and then I worked for SRAM. So I had the biggest film company in the world hire me from the beginning. And then I worked for the biggest like component brand there is. Right. And mm -hmm. the only one doing any sort of marketing. So I was like, had these two super easy jobs right off the bat. So I feel like I had to struggle after to like, mm -hmm. you know, every artist has to struggle. You yeah. Know? Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. That's where you learn the most. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yep. Yeah. All right, if you're following Brandon around all day, I mean, maybe since your videos were so long, it wasn't a big deal, but what's your editing process? Like, how do you decide what goes in? How do you organize stuff? On those first ones, I was just like, it's what would I watch? When it really comes down to it, everything I make is for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, like, mm -hmm. what will me and my friends watch? Because I... That's why I started making videos because I didn't like what was coming out and I wanted to make something better. I thought I could make something better. So then to this day, everything I make, I have to be able to make it through it. Hmm. So, sometimes I make some videos that I, I think suck, but <laughs> a lot of the time. But, so, but a lot of the time. Sometimes I make cool ones, but <laughs> those are the ones that are usually just me and the dudes and there's no like money involved or anything. The, those are the ones that I'm like really the most proud of. Cause I can get super weird. And like, I shot a roll of super eight yesterday where I was like shooting nine frames a second and doing like all these weird, cause the light was moving really fast and doing like all this weird stuff. And it just felt so good. You know, like I was like, wow, like I love doing weird stuff like that and trying to find different ways to like tell a story without telling a story. You know, like visually telling a story yeah. rather than having the guy just like, I like to ride these parts because, because <laughs> I'm a guy that rides parts. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's uh, cool. Where we'll start wrapping it up. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? 10 years? Yeah. Oh, rich. <laughs> I can get rich. Bitcoin? No, <laughs> I don't know. But I, I just know I am. Okay. I just have a feeling. All my friends, too. I'm going to bring them up with me. 
<laughs> oh, maybe Cam gets rich and it kicks down or something. It's probably a better bet than myself. I don't know. Ten years? Probably out at the ranch throwing sticks at rabbits. That's like my big thing right now. Yeah. What made you want to get out there? It's a like kind of escape down here. Uh I kind of had this like vision of my well my wife found the property and then of the property is 35 acres and we went out there and when i first saw it i was just like the things i could do out here you know like the things i could film the trails i could build like the rocks like i was just my mind was spinning on everything that i could do out there and we i started we bought it and then i started building trails and then the first trail that we got done and all friends start coming over and then projects have started to line up. And then this spring I'm basically just shooting out there full time. Mm. So that for me is the ultimate goal just to be out there building whatever dudes need to, to film on or say someone wants to test, I can build them a downhill trail or someone wants to do this. I can build this, you know, I can build whatever. And I have the eye for it from riding for years. So like, and all those dudes kind of trust what I build. Sure. So like, yeah, that's the ultimate goal. Ten years to be out there just building, yeah. digging, because I like to dig. <laughs> I like to dig holes. <laughs> Dude, I like the fact that you dig holes. You dig good holes. Have to. Yeah. It's like a thing. Like it's like hitting the vein. <laughs> like I have to dig a hole. My kid too, dude. My firstborn Levi. He digs holes. <laughs> That's awesome. It's like, what was he digging a hole for? He doesn't know yet, but he knows that he's making a jump. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. Is there anything you want to talk about we haven't brought up? I don't know. Get something off your chest. Sounds it off my chest. You don't <laughs> want to hear stuff yeah. on my chest. When we start talking about these yuppies moving into town. <laughs> oh man. There's just there's so much history and like you've influenced so many people and just been a part of so many different pieces of mountain biking that you know that that may seem important yeah you know? i don't know how important anything really is but it, with a grain of salt yeah, <laughs> yeah. With, within our industry yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah no that was what was cool with the jobs i've had i've gotten to like go out with like all these dudes and from this part of the mountain biking and then when enduro was coming up we were, i was like with those dudes and then when more so than my buddies who were just on the one path of like professional athlete and they were going to those events and they were on that. I was getting shipped around to all these other things and like doing lots of different aspects of mountain biking, right? Like going on, we went on this one thing in the Dolomites with Moreland. That was the big one where we really got into it, me and Tyler, because I was so over it. <laughs> now I think back on it, it was like a trip of a lifetime, but then I was like, what are we mountain biking so far for? You know, like <laughs> so far. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. no one here is even ripping. Yeah. Like, you know, like that's how I thought was like, you had to rip or for me to film it, mm -hmm. you know, like, and I had that mentality for a long time. And then I opened my mind up to just like, it's all cool and tell a cool story rather than just filming some dude rip, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Are you, are you trying to take stock of situations like that where, you know, at the time, like this sucks. Now you're saying that was a trip of a lifetime. Like you're trying to be aware of that stuff now. If something's yeah, not a hundred percent nowadays, I just like enjoy life. Like you go through something like your finger falling off and you start to really think things through, you know, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that was a real life changing situation. Having a kid, my finger falling off, like, there's a lot going on there for a bit. So yeah. I had a lot of time to think and yeah, I mean, I look back on stuff and I'm like, I can't believe I was such a prick. Like I should have been way cooler, you know, like, <laughs> but whatever, it was kind of fun. Experience. Experience. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I wouldn't take it back. Like you can't take anything back. So I was like, and it led me to where I'm at right now. So like if I would have been cool, would I've ever gotten these jobs? Like I was going to make sure that I was seen, you know? Like I felt like I was being washed to the side a bit, like Cameron and Kyle were making it. And I was like, no one was paying attention to me. And I was like, people are going to pay attention to me, whether they like it or not. Uh -huh. You know, like <laughs> yeah. then I got a megaphone. 
<laughs> and you did. You had an actual megaphone. <laughs> yeah. Chopper bought it for me, the dude from Smith. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's like, this guy's great. Let's buy him the loudest megaphone we can find. Dude, no way. Yeah. Yeah. Then Thanks. we stormed the Bike Magazine Awards. <laughs> that was wild. Yeah. Uh, thanks, man. Yeah, thank it's been you. It was fun. Yeah, it was fun. Glad we could do this. Yeah. When you came by back in Ventura or whatever a few years ago, like I thought about doing a like, podcast with you then, but I don't know why I just didn't feel right. And I'm glad no, it wasn't glad right. It worked out now. It wasn't right. Now I'm an adult, hmm. you know? Yeah. Like I was like not an adult for a long, long time. And I still like kind of not, but. Yeah, but I hope you don't ever become a full adult. Yeah, no, I won't. There's <laughs> yeah. no way. Like, it's impossible. I've tried. Yeah. Like, you can't, I can't do it. I was mowing lawns, man. Yeah. And I was going to buy the company off the dude. And I was going to mow lawns for the rest of my life. And then, then my finger got cut off and I was like, I don't mow lawns, man. I make videos. Hmm. You know, like, yeah. I make videos with my friends and this is what I do. And this is what I'm going to do. Whether it, whether I'm broke or what like sorry caitlin sorry kids like you might be eating craft dinner dude <laughs> they'll appreciate it yeah. I, I hope so yeah uh, andrea one time we were at rampage and cam's like doing donuts and kyle's like jumping to fire or something you know it's like after party of rampage and i was holding levi's like one and andrea looks at me he's like look at this kid man one years old, this is what he sees. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoa, that's some crazy perspective, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude. For sure. Yeah. Well, awesome. Thanks. Right Appreciate on. it. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Boom. A big shout out goes to Maxis Tires, Jensen USA, and Fox Shocks for supporting the inside line. Welcome, mountain bikers. <laughs>